Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here in this um, first one of our series on climate change uh, at the Rhodes Trust and with the Rhodes Scholars. My name is Rodolfo Lara. I, um, I'm in the global engagement team of the Rhodes Trust, and I have the pleasure of hosting today um, two very illustrious speakers to talk about a very, very current topic. We're just a few days away from the summit in Glasgow, and there is lots of interest in the topic. Before introducing our speakers, I just wanted to make um, a little bit of uh, publicity around an event that it's happening uh, in Glasgow, it seems, with some Rhodes Scholars. Um, a group of scholars in residence who are going to attend the, 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 the COP26 in, in Glasgow are putting together a, a dinner and get together, and it would most probably happen on the 6th of November. If anybody of you are attending and are interested in participating in this meeting, please send us an email to Rhodes House, um, to the Rhodes House alumni inbox. I will put that into the chat so that you can um, register your interest and, um, and we can send you details and connect you with the organizers of this, um, of this event. But now it's by, really my pleasure to introduce this um, um, Road Scholar Chat with Professor Dan Esty, Massachusetts and Bailey, 1983, who is a Hill House professor at Yale University and with appointments in both the law and environmental schools. He's the director of the Yale Center for Envi Environmental Law and Policy and co-director of the Yale Initiative on Sustainable Finance. And he will be led in this discussion by a scholar in residence, Nanak Narula, Tasmania and Green Templeton 2021, who is an environmental lawyer, consultant, and the 2021 Road Scholar for Tasmania. He is a consultant to the Oxford Sustainable Law, Law Program and is undertaking an MSc in environmental change and management. Thank you so much for being in with us. And without further ado, I pass over to Nanak. Thank you so much. Um, great to be here with everybody uh, on the call. I think it's one of the nice um, or, or kind of silver lining legacies of COVID that we're able to have everybody join from across continents. And of course, our wonderful speaker, Dan. So thank you all for being here. Um, I think just a couple of ground rules I'd like to touch on before I throw over to Dan for some opening remarks um, is that the way we're planning to structure the next 50 minutes to an hour together is that Dan will have some opening remarks and then we'll jump into a discussion for perhaps 30 minutes between us. Um, and then we'll throw over to Q&A. So there'll be plenty of time um, for all of you to be able to ask all the questions that you have. Um, I ask until then, please keep your microphones on um, to eliminate any background noise. As for the actual questions, you can write any questions you have as we're going in the chat. Um, or alternatively, when we throw open to Q&A, um, un unmute yourself and just speak to the camera so that um, you can actually speak directly to Dan. We want this to be as much as possible a conversation between the people on the call. Um, with that said, I'd love to throw over to Dan to kick us off. Thank you very much. Nanak, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Rodolfo. And, and really a big thanks to Georgia and Serena and the team at Rhodes House that pulled this together. It's uh, a joy to be able to do events of this kind, even if we all hope for uh, an end to the pandemic and a pull back from Zoom being our mode of connection. But for the meantime, this does allow us from uh, across the ocean uh, in several directions to connect and talk about uh, what I think is a critical moment. And, um, and that's really what I wanted to uh, put on the table here. I think we're gathered uh, literally at a watershed moment. Uh, the world community is coming together next week in Glasgow. Uh, so those of you in the UK will have uh, effectively front Zoom seats on, uh, on what will be going on. But it does seem to me that we are uh, at a moment uh, of make or break for the world's response to climate change. And I want to share with you um, that it does not seem like it's certain yet that the events in Glasgow will produce the kind of outcome people are hoping for uh, with real momentum building for the sort of action that's required. But I think there's reasons for optimism, and I want to share that as well. Uh, obviously, the, the backdrop to this is that we've got uh, a report that's come out uh, this summer from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, their so-called uh, sixth assessment report that says that the world really needs to move much more quickly to decarbonize, to deeply decarbonize than might have been uh, understood before. 
Uh, in that regard, I think one of the things we can anticipate from the gathering in Glasgow, this COP26, uh, by the way, we might do a, a quiz question to see who knows why it is COP26. Um, a lot of folks don't, at least among my students, um, but I won't hold you in suspense. It's the 26th gathering of the parties to the original 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, of course, this was meant to occur last year, but the pandemic uh, caused it to be delayed by a year. I do think one of the critical questions to be addressed, and I think likely point of consensus, is that the world needs to get to this kind of benchmark of deep decarbonization being described by most as a net zero greenhouse gas emissions world by 2050. And I do think there is an emerging consensus on that, although of course some countries are holding on to a, a later target date. Um, I think we also gather at a moment where there were over the course of the past few months, uh, terrible uh, droughts in some places, fires as a result, uh, floods in other places, and a growing sense that uh, at least what the science community is telling us we might need to expect more of is starting to appear in the way of climate change. It's also, of course, a critical political moment in a number of countries. Uh, since the world community la gathered last two years ago, uh, there have been important transitions in a number of nations, not the least of which is the United States, where a president who refused to address the issue of climate change has been replaced by one who cares deeply about moving uh, the world forward and the United States forward towards this deep decarbonization that's required. And I do think that is uh, important to have the United States back on the field, back in the game. Uh, at the same moment, some other countries have pulled back from participation. China will not have its president uh, with the community in Glasgow. Uh, Putin from Russia will not attend. So there are folks who are, I think, uh, pulling back Although I do believe the United States being back in uh, a leadership potential posture is important. Although I have to say, um, President Biden is scrambling to get a domestic climate change agenda through the Congress. And some of you may have heard that just this morning he announced a package uh, of activities and items and budget commitments that would be very significant, but even that does not yet have a, a clear political line to success. I think the other, and by the way, I guess the other thing I would tell you is I think whether or not uh, we get everything done at Glasgow that the uh, organizers are hoping, I do think there is now a big push to get serious uh, about climate change and particularly to really map out pathways to a net zero greenhouse gas emissions future. And I have been part of a team uh, of almost 100 researchers, scholars, policy experts across the United States that have developed a net zero action plan for the United States called in fact, America's zero carbon action plan. And I'll drop that link into the chat in just a minute. But I think we are um, clearly at a, a time when people are starting to look uh, with some optimism beyond the pandemic and a lot of discussion of how we're gonna build back better. That's in fact, the title of the Biden legislation that's being uh, unveiled today. It's also of course, a, a frame that Prince Charles has been using in the UK. The World Economic Forum has an initiative on this. And I think what's quite impressive is that despite the economic stress and the public health challenges of the last couple of years uh, and the tragedy of the pandemic, the issue of climate change has not been pushed away. The issue of sustainability has not been dropped from the public agenda. If anything, there has been a strengthening of commitment to sustainability broadly and climate change action in particular. So I wanna kind of set the conversation up today by saying, I think there remains a political challenge around getting the world community organized, a challenge within a number of important countries, uh, transitions, as I said, in a number of places, including Germany, that's been a, a really important force behind climate aid change action in the past and a leader in uh, decarbonization to the extent the, the society's committed vast resources to the build out of, uh, of solar power in particular, but also wind power. And I think in that regard, we have to take note of the fact that some of the momentum for change towards a sustainable future may need to come from beyond the political sphere. And that's one of the things I wanted to put on the table today, the idea that the business community is itself evolving, I believe, in quite uh, amazing and rapid ways with a recognition quite broadly now that the old model of shareholder primacy, 
the uh, famous Milton Friedman doctrine that companies, uh, corporations in particular, should work to maximize uh, the return, the profits of their owners, uh, so long as it was legal. I think that standard is turning out to be unacceptable in the 21st century, and we see a world of not just a focus on shareholders, but really a broader focus on stakeholders emerging, with companies having a duty to their suppliers, their customers, their employees, the communities they operate in, and society more broadly. And I do think you see a number of companies stepping up to this in the climate change context with commitments being made, pledges being made to become net zero greenhouse gas emissions businesses by uh, certain specific years, 2040 in some cases, 2050 in other cases. But I think this idea of net zero greenhouse gas emissions pledges as something that companies have to take seriously will be and could be an important element of what drives the transformation our society needs over the next three decades. And I do think there's forces beyond government that are pushing companies to do that. Um, governments, in fact, in very few cases have actually mandated anything of that sort. But I think what you see is a growing world of other pressures, uh, including from young people uh, and their future employees, including from their customers, and perhaps most notably, and perhaps with the greatest force, from their investors. And I want to hope to get into a bit of a conversation around that, because I do believe companies are starting to really feel the heat from investors, a growing sense that companies need to report more fully on their environmental, social, and governance performance, the so-called set of ESG metrics. And by the way, there's quite a mess in uh, regard to that set of metrics. My recent book that's just come out, which I think is going to be dropped into the chat today, Values at Work, uh, tries to make that point but also does highlight the value of having a real press from investors, uh, mainstream investors, who ever more want a more complete alignment between their personal values, which in many cases do in, does include a focus on sustainability, concern about climate change, and their portfolios. So I think that pressure from the business world, on the business world broadly, from a number of places beyond government, especially investors, is worthy of note. So with that, um, Nanak, I will pause and uh, let you jump in with some questions and look forward to turning this into a conversation. Thanks, Dan. I mean, there are so many points I want to jump into, um, but I might start, I think, chronologically with um, COP26. And in particular, keen to kind of pin you down a little bit further on some of your expectations and hopes coming out of COP26. I think you've very helpfully laid the terrain for us of some of the tensions that are at play geopolitically um, in terms of some of the, who the leaders might be for us. Um, but I know you have some personal experience at UNFCCC negotiations. And I think um, in the past, I know you've said that there's a, there's a real difference between a kind of real success and a celebrated success. Um, and I know in the UK in particular, you know, we, we do have governments that are likely to celebrate things which might actually fall short of what we require to hit those targets as expressed by the IPCC. Um, so I think, yeah, very interested to get your opinions on um, what your hopes and aspirations are and what you actually expect, I guess, to, to come out at the end of these two weeks we have before us. So Nanak, thank you. It, it allows me to uh, recall one of my favorite um, anecdotes from my own past work as a climate change negotiator going back to that 1992 framework convention. And I was a young uh, EPA official, part of the negotiating team. And I remember sitting with, uh, while waiting to see my boss, the, the EPA administrator at the time, Bill Riley, uh, sitting with Morris Strong, a great Canadian businessman, diplomat, who was in fact the, uh, the Secretary General of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. And uh, by the way, he'd also been the Secretary General of the 1972 First Earth Summit in Stockholm. So Morris Strong, really a, a heroic figure in the world of sustainability. And he took me aside and said, as we were chatting, uh, and I was saying how excited I was and asking him what he thought would come out of the gathering in Rio just a few months away, uh, which was at the time, uh, as of 1992, the largest gathering of world leaders that ever had been undertaken, uh, 125 presidents and prime ministers. And uh, Morris Strong said to me, Dan, you know, uh, when you pull this many people together with all their uh, other ministries and all the media that's uh, there, only two outcomes are possible, success and 
real success. And I think sadly, Morris Strong had it right. Um, we had, of course, a big declared success. But as I uh, moved on from my time in government and became a professor, uh, decades went by without real success in terms of the global response to climate change. I have been saying for some time, I think that the Paris Agreement of 2015 uh, provides a foundation for really turning the corner on this issue, getting serious about it, delivering real success. But not because I hinted in my opening remarks, I don't think it's a guarantee. And uh, what goes on in Glasgow over the next two weeks will be critical to that. So let me just highlight what I'm looking out toward uh, in answer to your question. I do think uh, an emerging consensus on this idea that we need a net zero greenhouse gas emissions world by 2050 is a starting point. And by the way, uh, consensus, and I always say this to my Yale students, does not mean everyone agrees. Uh, it means that most people mostly agree and that the major players uh, do agree. So I think you've got um, most of the big players now on the idea that 2050 is the target year. I think China will be there, if not by the time we leave Glasgow, uh, over the course of the next year or two. And um, I do think you know that is perhaps the big news that I expect to see coming out of Glasgow is this momentum for action and the commitment to change uh, and to transformative change that will be required to fulfill that target. I think there's also likely to be uh, a quite significant uh, conclusion drawn from the review of what countries have done over the past now really six years. Um, and that is uh, the sort of uh, stock take that was promised a year ago will actually happen now as we country by country look at the so-called nationally determined contributions, the promised action uh, plans that people, uh, the countries have put forward. And I think what we're gonna see, we know already is that some countries have, uh, have hit their own targets, have delivered on the change they promised. Many others have fallen a little bit short, including the United States. Uh, but there is clearly an understanding that we need people now to step up. So another expectation of mine is you will see a commitment by many to a greater ambition going forward, to trying to step those action plans up over the next time period. There will be, I think, some continued conversations about how we broaden who's involved. Uh, the Paris Agreement, of course, did a great service to the world by getting us beyond the prior division of the world into an Annex One list of countries, 44 roughly in number, who took on real commitments, and a non-Annex One list of everybody else, most of whom felt totally uh, entitled to sit on the sidelines. That was a terrible structure and a big mistake. Paris gets everyone into the game again with the, this idea that you set your own target, you offer your own nationally determined contribution. But I think it's also clear we're gonna need to push some countries to do more uh, and to do bigger things. And I expect you're gonna see a lot of pressure around that. I think there will be conversations about resources, about climate finance. Uh, and I think the, the reality is emerging that uh, the commitment made uh, back now at Paris and even a little bit before to $100 billion per year uh, of funding flowing to the developing world was not a commitment to have governments put that money up. It, what the, the word chosen was a critical one. It was to mobilize $100 billion per year. And it's quite clear now that a significant part of those funds will have to be private capital from private banks, private sources. Uh, and I think you're gonna find that the math being done suggests there was about 80 billion put forward last year, which is not bad against a 100 billion target, but does fall short. So there'll be some focus on what to do to fill that gap. Some other countries are gonna wanna have a conversation around loss and damage. The idea that those that have put emissions in the atmosphere over the past several hundred years should be liable, should compensate the, those who are facing harm. Uh, that will not move forward, uh, I can predict for you with confidence now. Uh, there are many countries, uh, including the United States, but a number of other major players who will not agree to that. And I think one of the critical questions is how on a voluntary basis, we get the flow of funds to those who are facing risk and threat and damage, because it's not going to come uh, as a result of, of a legally framed out loss and damage provision. But I do think there is a lot going on. And I would say again, just to reiterate a point from my opening comment, that uh, perhaps the most interesting thing is how quickly the private sector is feeling the cascade of responsibility 
for net zero greenhouse gas emissions coming from this emerging consensus at the government level. But I would tell you, I've just completed a survey with some colleagues at Yale and BNY Mellon Bank, and we have looked across the, the, the global 500, the 500 biggest companies, and not everyone has a net zero commitment, but a significant number of the group that we surveyed do, uh, roughly 70%. And of that number who are not yet committed, almost all are looking at what they have to do to make some kind of a net zero commitment. So I think one of the other critical factors is that if you care about change, you can't just wait for governments to get the work done. It's gonna increasingly be other vectors of pressure. And that is again, young people, future employees of these companies, customers, consumers broadly, and investors driving companies to, to march ahead, ahead of any schedule set by governments. That's by the really... way, for those of you, uh, not a, yeah, I could just yeah, say yeah. one more it's thing, for those close. of you who might be going to Glasgow for the first time or uh, who haven't been to one of these COPs before, uh, let me just say that the real action is not where the government delegates are. The real action is in the side events um, where think tanks and environmental groups, business groups, companies will be talking about what they're doing related to climate change. And that is where I think I'm gonna learn the most um, because what you're gonna see is some of the fresh thinking, the creative ideas emerging about how we get deep decarbonization done. And then frankly, you're gonna see a significant number of companies numbered in the hundreds making major statements about their action plans. Uh, above and beyond anything governments are asking them to do or, or requiring them to do. I'm very, very excited for that, I think, Dan. Um, and I, I really, there are a few points there I definitely want to pick up on in terms of mobilizing private sector capital um, and in terms of uh, mobilizing investment. Just before we get to that, um, I think you're making some very interesting points around you know, the previous distinction between Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries um, obviously mobilized out of an intention to demarcate between countries that had more responsibility for historical emissions and those that were seen as still needing to develop and needing to have pathways to development that might be more resource intensive. Um, so, so very interested in your comments as well on you know, loss and damage likely to be one of the sticky points that probably won't proceed at this COP. Um, so I think a, a question I'd love to put to you is, where you see the place for those sentiments of some form of common but differentiated responsibility or some form of kind of reckoning with the historical um, and I guess disproportionate emissions of industrialized countries versus those that are developed because I think we see this continues to be a sticking point I think even um, one of India's spokespeople came out the last couple of days raising this exact same point um, so, so where do you think progress will be and where do you think the proper place is for that sentiment and for those um, notions? So I think one of the lessons of the lack of progress from 1992 roughly to 2015 was that where countries are deeply divided and they have been divided on this question of what we sometimes talk about as burden sharing, who should take action, who should pay for the action to be taken to address climate change. Uh, and I think what the Paris Agreement did uh, Nanak is to actually take the phrase, the critical phrase that you just gave us, which is common but differentiated responsibility. And I would say that for 20 something years after 1992, the emphasis was, was on differentiated. And in Paris, we shifted the emphasis to the word common. And I think what you got was a sense that everyone had a common, country by country, all across the world, common obligation to step up and be part of the solution. And frankly, you're not going to get um, uh, some of the countries that would otherwise be on the hook to agree to liability. So I think the goal, again, is to figure out other ways to move the agenda forward with voluntary funding, which a number of countries will put forward. Uh, countries like Canada uh, have, have ramped up considerably, considerably their commitment in this regard. So I think you've got some countries willing to, on a voluntary basis, uh, step up to the financing challenge. And by the way, I would tell you as someone who's spent a, a lifetime both in and out of government and studying um, the issues of environmental progress and when it's not happening, why not? Uh, one of the fundamental flaws of our 20th century approach to climate change, but to environment more broadly, was to issue commands, to set targets and timetables, and then not ask what's gonna change behavior? What are the incentives for change? And where's the money gonna come from? And I think the good thing is, 
the climate world, the folks gathering in Glasgow are now very focused on these issues. Um, so I do think we're gonna see a serious uh, effort to both lay out pathways of change. That's why I was so excited to be part of the zero carbon action plan for America. And uh, I would urge people to take a look at it. It really works through sector by sector what kind of change is required. And, and by the way, it is transformative change in some sectors. You know, power generation has to completely shift, but you know, buildings have to change, transportation has to change, uh, food systems and sustainable agriculture have to be part of this. So really getting into the nitty gritty, which I think is now happening, is also something I expect uh, Glasgow to drive momentum on. Now, I think the, um, the answer to your question, Nanak, about where the concerns of folks like the Indians who are, are very uh, eager to insist that they have not put much of those emissions into the atmosphere, others have, and there should be compensation, I think is gonna play out in other venues. I personally think we do need uh, a much more vigorous sense uh, of environmental rights. Um, I've just written a piece, and I think there might've even been this dropped into the chat as a link, uh, called the End Externalities Manifesto. So with a colleague, I've it's just gotten published in the last week in the NYU Environmental Law Journal. And, uh, and this, uh, this piece basically says, we need to take environmental rights much more seriously. Our framework of environmental protection has been too focused on benefit cost analysis. And frankly, a certain vision of benefit cost analysis for those who are economists in the room, uh, a Calder Hicks model, where we ask a question uh, about industry that's polluting, do they provide net social value? And if the value of what they provide is greater than the harm they cause, we've said, okay, go forward. I think that's wrong. I think the, uh, the basic question should be, um, how much good are you doing? Is it greater than the damage you're causing? Because if you fail that test, you shouldn't be in business. But if you pass that test, you should be required to pay compensation, full compensation for your pollution harms or for the environmental resources you extract, often by the way, at less than full price paid for the timber or the water or whatever else it is. And I think we need to have uh, a new appreciation of kind of the underpinnings of environmental justice, which is a robust structure of environmental rights. So that's what I'm arguing for. And I think um, to sort of push this question back, not to your, uh, your, your core focus, I think there should be more of a rallying around the effort to have a global pact for the environment, uh, which has been pushed by some, including, by the way, the guy who led the charge to get the Paris Agreement done, that, who was at the time the French foreign minister, Laurent Fabius. He's kind of the leader behind this goal. And I think what it does is it provides a framework to try to establish a global expectation that environmental rights should be taken more seriously. Uh, and with environmental rights taken more seriously, I think environmental responsibilities will also be taken more seriously. And that would provide a starting point for perhaps country by country legal actions, because I don't think it's gonna happen on the global stage. I think it's gonna happen at a country scale. So that's my ultimate answer to where uh, those who are hoping for some form of compensation for the harm done to them are gonna have to look. Very robust, and that, that's very helpful, Dan. Um, and then I, th I think maybe then going back to some of your earlier comments about mobilizing private sector finance and some of the ways that we can facilitate more innovative models of um, incentivizing investment. Would love to, I think, hear you know the, the short summary of your key points in this area. We, we had a question sent in before by Sarah Yang, essentially asking about these elements of your sustainable finance and sustainable investing. Um, uh, proposals. And in particular, I think she was asking around the roles of banks and asset managers in driving the economy towards net zero emissions. So I think it's interesting, um, the survey that I've just uh, was mentioning briefly done, and we'll be publishing a piece on later this year, um, did find that when companies were asked, who is it that's pushing you to release more about your environmental, social and governance performance, it was asset managers. Um, and I think that's reflecting the fact that there is this growing set of mainstream investors who want that alignment between their portfolios and their values. So they're saying to their asset managers, you know, don't just put me into a portfolio based on profitability. I want to have it underpinned by some sense of responsibility. And as a result, you asset manager need to go out and figure out 
uh, whose uh, performance uh, on things like climate change, but this broader set of issues. Uh, and people vary a lot. That's one of my observations. They vary a lot in which piece of the sustainability agenda they care about. Some folks are very climate change focused. Some are frankly much more focused on the social agenda, care about the diversity of management, uh, about investments in human capital, about uh, attention to um, the gender diversity of uh, the board of uh, directors or the senior management. And I think um, given that, you do need to have a matrix of mandatory uh, metrics. Uh, and I think it's not 100, uh, but it's 20 to 30 core metrics uh, across the three domains of environment, social and governance performance. And I think it needs to be uh, backed by uh, a government structure, which is to say, if you misreport, you face legal consequences, not just uh, someone um, criticizing in the media, but actual legal consequences. And so I am in favor of a, of a three-tiered structure of enhanced environmental social governance reporting. Tier one being a set of things that everyone's going to report on, regardless of industry. A second tier being industry-specific metrics that uh, relate to the issues of that industry that might vary from others, recognizing that mining and banking are different. Um, and then the final platform or tier would be company-specific narratives. Uh, and I do think in some regards, it'll be that third tier, the company-specific, which can't be dominant. It can't be that you tell your story all the time your own way. You need comparability in the data. And by the way, the set of metrics is not just a list of metrics, it's underlying methodologies of how to report. So that when you're asked to report, for example, on scope three emissions, you can't do it your own way. You have to do it consistent with an established methodology allowing us to benchmark one company against another, one industry against another. But I'm also interested in the company specific narrative because I think what investors really need to know, and again, this is one of my chapters in that Values at Work book I mentioned, uh, is the management's vision and strategy for transformation in the face of this sustainability imperative, the need to take sustainability seriously and, and quite specifically and immediately to move towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions by roughly 2050. And I think you're gonna see a big variation with some companies quite focused, quite sharply thinking about this, remaking their business model to conform to this new reality and others giving it a little bit of the back of the hand. And I think the back of the hand won't be well regarded by investors going forward. So that's kind of uh, the structure I see, enhanced ESG uh, reporting uh, on a structure that is defined by governments, one hopes with some complementarity and some similarity across countries, perhaps even coordinated broadly around the world. Uh, I would love to see the stock markets of the world do this uh, as a collaborative venture. Uh, and I do think in, the, in critical countries, it is the reporting by public companies that'll define the baseline. Um, and I, I think it needs to step up the pressure on companies to be seen as aligned with society's expectations for the future. And you've given us a whole a whole lot of very rich proposals in such a short amount of time down with the you know matrix of core metrics and the global pact for the environment um i have a ton of follow-up questions myself but i'm conscious that i promised everybody that have at least 20 minutes to jump in as well um i think we had a question in the chat from eric um asking or sorry what is the best way to ask a question this session um i guess just to restate for everybody i'll now throw it open so if anybody would like to just unmute themselves then ask a question directly, please do so. If you'd prefer, given that this is a live recording to type a message, I'm happy to read it out for you as well um, and can keep that anonymous. So I'll give a little pause, feel free to jump in, anybody that's interested to ask a question of that. Hi, hi, hi Nanak, thanks for that. And thanks Dan so much um, for your comments and, and your leadership over the years. Um, so I um, have been in the space of working with the companies that you cite. You and I have interacted a few times. I've been at BSR for almost two decades. A big fan and champion of this idea that the private sector can and should um, go um, you know, out in front of government as needed to, to meet its own long-term uh, needs and our collective long-term needs. That, that faith remains undented and yet, um, as I'm sure you would agree, you know, we look at moments like we're going through politically in the U.S., even with a supportive president, 
We think about the cycles of time where we've had opportunities to translate ambition by a few into action by the many, and it always founders on the rocks to some extent of our domestic political reality. One of the things I'm thinking a lot about now, and I'd love your perspective on, is what, what if any, I guess you could argue, what's the, it's great that corporates are setting net zero targets for sure, and I've helped a number of them do that they're not going to make good on those commitments regardless of their intentions without some fundamental changes to policy, which they themselves are key players in helping us to promote. What do you see as the best opportunities and the highest priorities for big companies that say they care to play the right role in our political process? And I guess I'm being shamelessly US centric on this one. I'm thinking US politics. And are you optimistic? Based, based on that, are you optimistic? <laughs> I, I actually am um, reasonably optimistic. I think uh, a vast number of companies, as I said, the survey we've just done says something like 70% are stepping up to some kind of a commitment. Now, your point, Eric, is a good one, which is we don't know how deep these commitments are, how serious they are, whether they survive a transition uh, in the senior leadership of the company. But I think it's starting to become seen as a, uh, a necessary element of what it of uh, what it takes to be a head of a company or part of a management team in a in particularly a big company, and I think you're seeing some of the asset managers. I'd point to Larry Fink uh, at BlackRock in particular, basically saying we're not going to put in our portfolios companies that don't take up this agenda, and I suspect over time he will say who don't take it up seriously. And uh, another area of my own research uh, in this paper that I'm working on is around what a, a best practices set of uh, elements would be for a corporate net zero greenhouse gas emissions pledge. Uh, and one of the core questions, again, in that regard, and Eric, one could make this the, the touchstone of your test uh, of who's you know, really getting on this and who's not, is how much companies are committing to their own business model transformation and the reduction of emissions and how much they anticipate uh, paying in the way of buying carbon offsets so that they don't have to change their business model. And I think one of the tests are gonna be uh, what will be whether companies are at the point of you know 95% emissions reduction, residual small percent of offset, or whether it's going to be um, uh, some number of industries and companies that think they can get away with 60% emissions reduction and offsetting 40%. And by the way, I give um, some greater time and some greater slack to the very difficult to decarbonize industries, um, you know, cement, steel, which society needs and wants. But I do think these folks should be expected to pay, uh, you know, immediately in a spirit of this new, no uninternalized externalities world, no um, environmental spillovers of harm. Uh, they should expect to pay fully for whatever uh, damage their emissions they're releasing is causing, uh, evaluated at global prices. Uh, and I think that uh, that that reality is coming faster than a number of companies expect. Thanks, Dan. Dan, we, we've had two questions in the chat, which I think are relatively related, so we'll move to those. Um, so the first one was from Jason, essentially asking your opinion on degrowth, whether negative growth is required as part of the story to get to net zero, or whether we can get there through technologies um, supplemented with, with some reorganizations and how we live. Um, and I think the, the other question, which is, has some similar aspects, is from uh, Alexander, which was sent ahead of time which was around whether it's actually possible to cut CO2 emissions without drastically reducing economic output. Um, he's mentioned uh, Janchevici, I might be butchering that name, um, who's an author that argues that this is inevitable given that economic output and transport in particular are very highly correlated with fossil fuel use. So a lot to go off there, but throw yeah, it to those, those are, from Jason Alexander. Thank you. Those are great questions. And um, Frankly, I can tell you one thing for sure, which is that um, uh, negative growth is not happening. Um, you know, we still have a world full of developing countries that want greater aspirations to be fulfilled. Um, and I think the real test then has to be, can we achieve growth without emissions growth? Because the economic aspirations will survive. I promise you that. Because there's a very large number of people, including in the developed nations, who would rather have warming and climate change 
uh, than give up the material benefits of modern life. So, um, and I've seen that throughout my career. There's often kind of an enthusiasm uh, for the prospect uh, of a no growth future. There's in fact, serious scholarly work that's done it uh, on this by people like Herman Daly, but it's not going to happen from a political point of view. So the real test then is, can we innovate ourselves into a place where we are able to deliver the goods and services that people want, but without greenhouse gas emissions? And again, this is why I think the work now being done uh, to really map the pathways to deep decarbonization is so important. And you're quite right. Uh, it's going to require, you know, in raising the issue of transport, it's going to require electrification of transportation. We're going to need to have cars, trucks, and eventually trains, and perhaps someday planes, that's a tough sector, uh, that are really running on electricity generated by non-polluting sources of renewable energy. And I think that's why wind power, solar power uh, are so critical, but I also want to see a much wider set of innovation activities going on. Uh, I think it may well be you can do wave power or um, tidal power, uh, perhaps geothermal power in some places. And by the way, the answer for deep, deep decarbonization probably will vary from place to place. So I do think that's the real test here is how do we get to uh, doing all the things we want to do in new and different ways that don't damage our commitment to sustainability broadly and the need for action on climate change in particular. I just want to first give the opportunity for either um, Jason or Alexander just to have quick follow-up questions to that one because I, I think it's a very meaty and, and um, frequently emotional and, and contentious issue. So um, we'll give you the chance to do that if you want, Alexander and Jason. I'll, I'll follow up really quickly if you can hear me. Uh, so, I mean, your response seemed to privilege the notion that I was suggesting that degrowth needed to necessarily imply degrowth in every country, which is not the case, obviously. You could imagine a scenario which, <clears throat> politically unpalatable as it might sound, the US would be, or, you know, I'm just using the US as a stand in for, for wealthy um, industrialized countries, but that degrowth would happen in some sense in some countries while uh, you know the balance minus something could happen in other countries allowing for dramatic increases in, in the standard of living in developing countries even as we reduce um, standards of living in in wealthy countries so I, I i think that's important to put on the table i wasn't suggesting for example that poor countries would have a cap on you know where they are currently um, and the second thing is it sounded to me like what you're saying is that simply because it's politically unpalatable, the solution must necessarily involve technological innovation. But if the cliff is coming at a, at a fast enough pace and the technology is just not gonna get us there, the politics will change, they will have to change. Um, and so I guess my question was more, do you think it's possible or are we going to be confronted with a situation where degrowth will become the only political solution um, in, in some short order? So Jason, I admire you're pushing the point harder. Um, I'm going to push back harder. There is no chance that degrowth is the answer. No chance. Um, the political majority in America would rather have climate change than the end of growth and kind of the stopping of the material well-being of society and the advances in material well-being. So I don't accept the premise of your question that the uh, innovation possibilities are falling short. And I, by the way, don't limit the innovation that's required to technology, although that's critical. But I also think there needs to be innovation in partnerships, in financing, uh, in the incentives that are in place, in government policy. So I'm a broad innovation kind of guy. And I do think um, that the breakthroughs are starting to emerge. And I would tell you that I think the, the path forward is there, um, although we still need to figure out some pieces. And it does require potentially, uh, instead of a no growth uh, future strategy or a degrowth strategy, it may require at some significant expense, and I think the politics could change on this, where people are willing to bear a higher expense to keep the world moving forward. Um, I, I do think, first of all, there's many things that can be done on a decarbonized or dematerialized basis. Um, I do think we're headed for a circular economy where packaging and so on uh, is not thrown away. There should be a, a zero waste goal, but I do think they're going to people are going to find ways to reuse uh, and recapture and remake a lot of the things that we have currently in circulation and eventually being thrown out. Um, second, I do think carbon capture is going to be part of the answer. So I'm a big believer we should be investing more in carbon removal strategies. 
Uh, at Yale, we've just launched a, a carbon capture center funded, by the way, at a huge scale, $110 million behind that. Because I do think it, it's quite clear now that the possibility of getting the emissions down to zero is not going to happen, which is why we all talk about net zero. And the net part of that is going to be some greater degree of carbon capture, including nature-based solutions, which can be part, but not the only part of, of the capture story, which is to say more tree planting, reforestation in some places, afforestation, uh, better land use management broadly, better uptake of carbon on farmlands, all of that's part of the story. But I do think there's gonna have to be some engineered carbon capture. And that's already beginning. Uh, first uh, commercial scale plant, small, but commercial scale opened in Iceland uh, a couple of months ago. So I think carbon capture is more likely the place that people invest as opposed to committing to a degrowth strategy. I have to also hold myself back here. I think, Dan, um, as an Australian acknowledging my positionality, we've just had our own net zero to 2050 strategy announced with about 70% of the reduction to, net, uh, to 2050 being based on technological advances. So I think there's a similar optimism in the Australian government um, maybe uh, maybe a bit more excessive. <laughs> are those commitments, uh, by the way, are those commitments to uh, technology developments based on technologies that are in hand or in, in sight? Or is it a, a wish and a hope that certain things will be cleaned up that aren't currently? It's a mixture of both, uh, really, Dan. There's 15%, which is wish and a hope. I think it's international advancements is the name. And then 40% of future technologies they're investing in. Um, but, but that is a broader discussion and um, definitely want to leave space for some other, other comments. So Monica, um, does can anyone... I pick up another question yeah, coming please, out, of, please go uh, down. Uh, out of the chat? Uh, yes. My uh, Oxford uh, classmate uh, and uh, hockey buddy, John McCall McBain, is asking, what if some countries or sectors are not on board the program? Is it OK uh, or will it be necessary to have some structure of tariffs for non-compliant countries or uh, or companies uh, or industries or products? And I think the answer to that is a, a resounding yes. And I, I believe the European U Union is already developing a border carbon adjustment mechanism uh, with the not too attractive acronym of CBAM. Um, but it is, it is almost certainly going to require that uh, the rules of trade be structured so that countries um, are held accountable for subpar climate change strategies. And anyone who's exporting from that kind of a country should expect their products going into places that are on board a robust climate change action plan to put a border tariff on for everything coming in equal to the differential from the low standards countries kind of production cost benefit from not adhering to climate change commitments uh, and not adhering to the global game plan of net zero emissions by 2050. Now, the methodologies of how you produce that could be quite tricky, but it's being worked out thoughtfully, carefully. I, you know, I've been watching what the European Union is doing, and as someone who's written uh, a good bit on trade and the environment, I can tell you, I think what the European Union is doing will be judged to be consistent with the rules of the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, and as a result, will be upheld when challenged, and uh, it will be a great mechanism for forcing foot dragging countries to step up their game. And frankly, absent that, the risk of competitive disadvantage to the producers in high standard countries is overwhelming. Uh, it produces, by the way, a bad effect, which we know as carbon leakage by simply having people move production activities from high standard countries to low standard countries. And as we know, the, the planet doesn't care where the emissions come from. The atmosphere is affected no matter what. So it's, uh, it's a critical element of a successful strategy. Thank you, Dan. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I note that there's a hand up from Alexander, if you did want to jump in and ask a question. <clears throat> I think you might be on mute still. Cannot sorry. hear you now. So sorry about that. Yes, yeah. perfect. Um, um, I admire your um, your optimism about the uh, <laughs> uh, not the optimism, but um, I think you're right that there's there's really no political uh, buy-in for um, you know uh, degrowth. But uh, 
at some point when fossil fuels run out, there will be a degrowth unless a solution can be found for transport. And all electric transport with the current technology is simply a fantasy because there's no source of energy that's, that's dense enough. So I just wanted to put that in as a comment. I'm not going to... Sasha, I'm not sure that's true. Um, you know, I'm driving an electric car right now in a state where much of the power comes from nuclear power. We may have to revisit things like our commitment to nuclear power. I, I think that's an alternative. Yeah. And you're quite right. It's certain uh, heavy ends of the spectrum, heavy transport by truck uh, and, and shipping and aviation are, are currently facing challenges. But this is why so much work is going on uh, in the area of hydrogen. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm optimistic that there are breakthroughs coming that will get us um, to a place where those hard to decarbonize sectors can get close to, if not fully decarbonized. Yep. It currently takes a lot of carbon to produce hydrogen. It currently emits a lot of CO2. Uh, not necessarily. But That's why the first um, planned, uh, you know, there's some of the first of these facilities are where you've got access to a low cost, uh, zero carbon electricity source, um, you know, a hydropower source. Um, or potentially geothermal, which is why Iceland is one of the places that's been uh, focused on. So my sense is, and by the way, a number of developing countries are quite excited about this because some of them are high solar capacity, high wind capacity, high hydro capacity, and they may be the places where the hydrogen gets produced because they can provide that electricity that allows you to do electrolysis, to break water apart. Um, and it does require a lot of energy, but if you had access to a, a, a zero carbon car, uh, electricity source, you might be able to get it done. Thank you. If we, I think we might have time for one last question um, with a succinct answer, Dan. Um, I think you've been, yeah, managing to get through them very quickly. So if we have one last one that we can take. I think we've got a hand up from Tim that's been sitting there for a little bit. If you want to unmute yourself and jump in. Okay, Dan, this is part of the debate we have is a long standing one about techno scientific salvationism. You seem to be quite an evangelist for that. <clears throat> the problem is that we live on a materially limited uh, planet with infinite uh, energy throughput. And we are proceeding on the opposite assumption that we live on a infinite material planet with limited sources of energy. In other words, we have the metaphor 180 degrees around and we have to reverse that understanding culturally within what might be regarded as a geologic nanosecond. That is the time we have left in geologic terms is very, very slim. In fact, a nanosecond in geologic terms. And in fact, we have to adopt a whole new set of valuations that don't have to do with pricing or markets or uh, elections or anything that can be put up. You're quite right that the no growth uh, option has no future in elective democracies. It has no future in dictatorships either that are based on go growth economics. The problem is go growth economics. You have to learn to make do with what Herman Daly has outlined for decades as a steady state economy. So it Tim, let me, me just in the spirit of um, bringing us to a close on time, say thank you for raising that. There really is a, uh, a world out there that is aligned with you and that thinks that we're gonna be able to uh, kind of remake uh, people's beliefs in, in what they care about. And uh, you know, including folks like uh, another uh, Rhodes Scholar, Gus Speth, the former Dean of the Yale School, of the environment where I am located. Uh, and yes, is another pretty, Balliol person. <laughs> so another Balliol guy. And he and yeah. I uh, have long <laughs> had debates because I think we see the same problems, uh, but we come to very different prescriptions of the way forward. And I tell you from my 30 years in and out of the policy arena, uh, it turns out to be very, very hard to get certain kinds of change. And I'm a believer that some elements of the move to a sustainable future will be based on changed values and changed behavior. Uh, but I think other parts of it are so difficult to change that you really wanna be careful. And I'll just give you a 30 second antidote and give uh, uh, us all a chance to close on time. Uh, I, I've been looking for a long time at how to uh, promote better public transit. 
And it turned out, um, we did a survey finally at Yale to try to understand why it was so hard and who was most resistant to uh, really pushing people out of cars and into public transit. And I thought that it would be young people or, or something like that. No, you probably, some of you would know who is most addicted to their cars? Working mothers. And the thought that you were gonna get um, those folks to be able to get to the schools, get to the little league games, get to the soccer practice, the dance lessons, uh, to the store and the dry cleaner all on a bus is just not happening. So it turns out I had to learn a very hard lesson that in some cases you have to anticipate behavioral change is not possible. And the answer had to be to find a car that doesn't pollute rather than make sure everyone could take the bus. Now I'm still a big believer in public transit, but I know the limits of it. And uh, in most places, those limits are real. And if you run hard against the reality of women in the workforce, you are going to lose. And I say the same thing about uh, a, a degrowth strategy. Uh, there are most countries in the world, developing countries for sure, but even developed countries who would rather suffer climate change than uh, give up on uh, modern life as they know it. So I'm a big believer, not that it's um, the only choice, but it's the only politically attractive choice is to really double down on innovation. So I, I will pause there and say, Nanak, thank you for running us through as much uh, of this as we got through. It really was a wide ranging conversation. I'm grateful to you for putting so much on the table. Of course, Dan, and, and thank you again so much for speaking to us. I think it is a real treat to have you. I know before um, the Zoom started and the general, the general group joined that we we're speaking about, that it's been four years since you were here last. So we hope it's not four more years until you're here with us at Rhodes House in Oxford. Um, I think as everyone on this call could attest to, it's a real privilege to have you. I think as someone that is very much a propositional thinker in this space, um, an area which is you know, rife with critique, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you put out so many different um, options and proposals and different ways for us to think about these very, very complex problems. So thank you once again. Um, I know there's a lot for me to ruminate upon. I'm sure it's the same for everybody else, but it's been a delight to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, a huge thanks to the entire Rhodes team that put this together. And I look forward to seeing some of you who are uh, going to be uh, in Glasgow next week, uh, potentially for this dinner that's being proposed by Rodolfo. So thank you all for being part of the discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.